Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this another edition of Safari Live. And we have an unusual opening for you today. And no, it's not that tree. Just look at this. There's a lot of action here, partially because of the rain we had, as well as temperature. You can see these termites are quite active. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. My name is Chris and with me today on CAMOPS is Owen Dell. And our plan today is to bring you exactly the small things out of the bush. We're going to be driving around, maybe do some small walks, short walks. And hope you introduced to some of the really smaller aspects. And this is about as small as it gets. Termites. And more specifically fungus growers and before we get to that weather wise it's overcast there is a possibility of rain but indications are we're probably going to head up to about 33 degrees today going to be possibly a humid day but we will monitor it as we go along and I would love you to ask me some questions about these termites. In fact, anything goes. This is a live and interactive experience. So send us questions or let me know what you would like to see today or chat about. It's after all your safari out here in the African bush. And while we watch these termites, Joining us at Juma will be Kelly this morning and camels there will be Mpo and Ben will be with Craig as well at Juma and then at Amakala Andrew and Morgan will be doing their thing there and then Nick will be at Kariga. Right, what do we have here? I said fungus growers. Right, termites in a nutshell. Kavuki, good morning. Before I get to the termites, good morning to you as well, Kavuki, and welcome aboard. Safari, the best thing on this Friday morning, absolutely. Right, let's get back to it. Termites, I said fungus growers. Now, remember that termites are basically, I won't say detritus feeders, they are consumers of dead plant material. Their main food source is cellulose and lignin all right let's look at grass once the green grass dies it turns into lignin or cellulose which is complicated carbohydrates which very few creatures can digest in fact even the herbivores we see cannot digest it they are host to a whole group of microorganisms that we refer to as flagellates it's a combination of fungi, bacteria, as well as protozoa, which digests that. They ferment these things, and their byproducts are then used as a fuel. Most termites do have those flagellates in their gut system. However, this particular termite, the fungus growers, lack those flagellates or microorganisms that can digest cellulose and lignin. So what do they do? They grow a fungus. In fact, this fungus cannot exist without termites and vice versa. In fact, it's even named termitomyces. So what happens is they've got gardens underneath these termite mounds where they literally keep Craig, I love that question. I was about to get to that. How do they make these pathways and holes in the ground? Craig, I'm going to get to that in a moment. So these termites, the fungus grows, or macrotermies, they literally cultivate a fungus. They harvest dead wood, dead plants, dead plant material. And deep underneath here, they've got chambers where they literally cultivate the fungus that grows on this finely chewed plant matter. And the fungus then breaks down 
the plant material into more digestible compounds is actually their byproduct that the termites consume as a food source. This brings forth a couple of problems, metabolic heat as well as gas, CO2 for instance. So these termite mounds you see are literally a valve for air, hot air as well as gases to escape into and by opening up and closing holes they regulate the temperature as well as get rid of metabolic gases. How do they make it? It's a, they basically harvest swill particles from very very deep below as well as water. So one of the crucial things is where they build these mounds there needs to be underground water or subterranean water. And it's a combination of swill particles, the ex excrement and water and they literally build it. And what you see here, these are all females. All of these little termites you see there are workers. They're not females, sorry, males and females. With ants, it's only females. With termites, the worker cast are a mixture of immature males and females. And what gets me every time I see this is that, look at the artwork. Look at the precision a tiny creature with a brain smaller than a grain of sand that can construct this. Incredible. And ladies and gents, this sets the trend for what we are going to do today. So while we head out further into the woods and find more small things out here, Let's head over to Kelly to say good morning. Thanks, Chris. This really is the time of year for all things wild and wonderful. There are bugs out. There are termites out. Um, fabulous time of year to be looking at all the smaller things that are such an impo important part of the ecosystem here. Good morning everyone, my name's Kelly. I'm going to be with you this morning and with me on camera we have Mpo. We are sitting here on quarantine and uh, we had a lovely image of a fem very pregnant female impala stood really on a termite mound and all of a sudden all these impala we're looking at here they jumped and they snorted and they all bunched up together and we everything went up in the air we went oh leopard 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 and we got to here and all the impala were staring into the grass and and a steambox stood up and they all went kuh, 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 kuh. and this poor little steambox <laughs> sort of looked and went what what have I done and ambled off across there um, and I said to Impala, I'm really glad I'm not an Impala. Imagine that constant pressure of literally everything might kill you. Um, and shame, the poor little steam box wandered off over there to go about his day. Um, but all these Impalas got a huge fright. It was like a big Impala explosion of panic. Um, <laughs> can't, be, can't be fun being an Impala out here, but... Lots of these females are heavily pregnant now. What what date is it? I don't even know what date it is. Fourth? Is it the fourth now? Fourth? Fourth of November, possibly. They are most definitely on their way to giving birth. And we will see who is going to get the right date. But all these Impala have relaxed again now. Girlies, good morning. And gone back to gone back to feeding and I'm actually really looking forward to the first morning we come out and see these babies because I'm sure we will see here on quarantine oh they're looking quite uncomfortable now so this morning um, I'm gonna probably head west ish um, north northwest ish check around Impala monkey orange I might just pop back really quickly 
um, to where we left Tavern Gummy last night. I've got a feeling he's probably um, crossed towards Baobab Dam, but I'm just going to pop up there and have a quick look. And um, then we will carry on and see what we can find for you this morning. Please send in all your questions and comments. We love to hear them. A battle of the ages has begun. Now one guide reigns victorious. The rest covered his crown. Now, back by popular demand, it's Animal Bingo. It's time for a shot at redemption to become the safari king <laughs> or queen. Scores will be kept on a leaderboard and the ultimate winner will be crowned on Christmas Day. Catch the chaos and contention on every Saturday sunset safari. Bingo Saturdays. Good morning everybody. We have some waterbuck to start the day for me here in Juma. We are still quite close to Gary Dam as the neighbour suggests. Waterbuck normally found within a few kilometres of water. Always a nice way to start the day. My name is Ben and on camera I have Craig with me. And as I'm sure you've seen, it's a relatively cool and overcast morning this morning, although the humidity is quite high. Uh, and these waterbuck seem to be enjoying life. We've uh, been following them down central towards Gary Cutline as they've made their way away, uh, made their way away from the dam. Well, that was a bit of a mouthful. Um, but yeah, with these waterbuck, you will always find them relatively close to water. Uh, you can see that very shaggy coat that they have in comparison to most of the other antelope species which means they do get very warm and the only way they can counteract that is by sweating and they sweat profusely uh, on a really hot day it is not unusual for a waterbuck to sweat between 20 to 30 liters of fluid which means they have to replace said fluid so they drink a lot of water so they can't afford to be too far away from water Having a little bit of a groom this morning. Oh, and a rogue impala. Photo bombing our water buck. It's a bit of a mystery as to why they have such shaggy coats. I've never seen or heard or read an acceptable explanation as to why the water buck has such a shaggy coat 
and none of the antelope really do in comparison. The only theory that I personally have come up with is the fact that particularly during the winter, if you are going to be hanging around close to water sources, you are most likely to be in low-lying areas, as that's where most water holes uh, tend to form because of the underground flow of the water. And it gets cold here in the winter. Uh, morning, Kip. Thank you for the question. Um, well, breeding habits of waterbuck. Well, you have a territorial male, so a dominant male who will hold an area, obviously normally around water, where there is some good graze because they do graze on grass. Is one lying down somewhere in the grass? Is he just behind that bush, uh, Craig? Oh yes, that's the ears. Um, and then you have breeding herds of females and they will pass between territorial males and males will try and mate with them. Um, you'll get bachelor groups of course, uh, but generally speaking, yes, it will be a territorial male with a group of females. So very similar, for example, to, let's think of a, a similar example, um, a rhino, for example. You'll have a territorial bull uh, and then the females are not territorial, they have a home range uh, and they will sort of move between bulls' territories. Quite a long gestation period for our antelope species. They can be up to around about nine months, so the same as humans. If you compare that to that little impala who skipped past, uh, which is about six and a half to seven months. But imagine sweating 30 litres of sweat every day. I think they must also lose a lot of salt doing that as well. I remember when it gets really hot here, it doesn't matter how much water you drink, uh, you still end up with a headache because the, the fluid just goes straight in and then straight out again. Um, and you need to replenish those electrolytes, so salts and sugars. I've never heard of anything about them having a particularly a particular preference towards a salty diet, as it were. Shall we move forward? At oh no, you can probably see some through the gap there, Craig. Can you? Rather than disturbing them. Because certainly here, I remember when I first started to work at one of the lodges there. One of the sort of induction processes you have to do is we used to have to do the boundary walk, which was about 42 kilometres. So it was the best part of a marathon. And you have to do that in a day. So you walk the entire boundary of the property. And uh, I was unfortunate enough to have to do that in February when it was incredibly warm. And I don't know how many litres of water I drunk, um, but my head was pounding by the end of it. I think we're going to have to move, Craig, okay? Um, because it's all really well, so having replacing the fluids, but it's those electrolytes, those salts and sugars that you need to get. So a little tip, I know you can get those sachets which uh, will help replace your electrolytes. Uh, I know a lot of people poo-poo them. I personally am actually a big fan of them. They have saved me on many occasions. But if you're stuck somewhere um, out of the bush, maybe you're doing a trail or something and you can't, uh, you don't have any of those things, you can actually make your own sort of rehydration uh, drink. You with a, basically take one litre of water uh, and then you can add... I forget the exact measurements, but it doesn't really matter. It'd be like a couple of teaspoons of salt and a couple of tablespoons of sugar and just shake it all up and drink that. And that is very good for you. And it's preferable rather have uh, room temperature water. A lot of people want to drink cold water, but that actually costs energy and your body wastes a bit of that because your body has to then warm up the cold water to process it. So room temperature water, bit of salt, bit of sugar, and uh, that will should get rid of your headache if it's dehydration related. All right, the um, rest of my plan is I'm going to go and have a look for these buffalo. I've got tracks going north away from Gary Dam. We've got side tracks that went south with these water bucks, uh, but I'm going to go look for those buffalo. In the meantime, let's send you back across to Kelly, and I think she has some giraffe for you. Good luck with your buffalo search, Ben. By the time I stopped counting those buffalo yesterday crossing the road, I think I got to 303. And we certainly weren't at the front of that herd when they crossed. 
We've just seen this beautiful little group of giraffes. It looks like, like yeah, it's three. Oh no, that's a young male. There's a female <clears throat> feeding here and this fairly young calf. These calves quite vulnerable to uh, predators. Obviously it stopped right behind the tree. And that female's got a lovely little gathering of ox peckers on her there. These females spend a lot of time browsing. They've got a very um, far reach. Susan, I don't think they'd intentionally eat bugs off plants. Um, I'm sure if there was a huge big bug, they would maybe try and avoid it. But they have to... They have to work hard to get as much nutrients as they can from their diet. They, you can see there, this giraffe's feeding on tiny, tiny little leaves. Um, and I, I, if there was a massive bug, they'd probably like they wouldn't eat through a community spider's web. Um, but I'm sure if they accidentally ate the odd one or two, it wouldn't phase them too much. This youngster's feeding here now. These young ones, they do stay around mum quite close. Like I said, they're quite vulnerable to predators. I've seen several, um, I've actually, I've actually seen a leopard with a giraffe kill before. We never quite worked out if it was, it was the leopard that killed it or it stole it from someone else, but we think it was. Um, but regularly, prides of lions will, um, take giraffe. These young ones, there's a there's a myth that giraffes are always silent. They're they're not. I've heard giraffes make scuffy. I've heard youngsters making sort of scuffing, snuffling sounds, um, but they don't make loud sort of mooing sounds. Um, Philip, do giraffe markings fade? No, not really. Um, if anything, some people say they get more pronounced. The males get darker as they get older. Um, I think there is some element of, of truth in that. Um, but no, those markings don't fade as they get older. Not in, not in my opinion, anyway. I've seen some very old bulls with very defined, clear markings. Gonna wander off into the thickets. They're continuing their breakfast. I think I'm also going to continue. <clears throat> I found that um, <laughs> that offending stimbok. Um, shame, poor little guy. Probably got as much of a fright as as the impala did. I'm just gonna turn around here. I think I do want to pop up to um, the spot where we left. Tavern Gumi yesterday. I was so happy to see him yesterday. I've been checking that spot for many, many hours. So I'm, I've, I found him there now. I'm not going to get um, too hung up on it, but I do just want to check and see. He might have turned around and come back into Juma. I've got a feeling probably not, but we will go and have a little look in the area. I'm going to head on back up that access and I'm going to send you over to the delightful Andrew to say his good morning.
Ah, oh, thanks very much. Uh, yes, I do want to say hello. Morning, everybody. Welcome to Amakala again. Uh, we are currently at the Jackal Den sites, but there's been no visual the last few times that we've been coming here, which is quite strange. And we think perhaps maybe they have changed the den sites. Who knows? But we will look for it and keep you updated. But morning again. My name is Andrew. I do have my good friend Morgan with me on board this morning. And it's going to be a nice day here in Amakala today. Okay, so it is quite normal that jackals do change the den sites from time to time. And we think that's exactly what's happened here. And Morgan noticed the adults yesterday, uh, not too far from this area. So we're thinking that maybe they've changed their den site more towards the thicket environment, which is sort of behind us. And uh, we will full follow up there and see what's going on. Now, as I said, it's quite normal for them to change den sites. Uh, they want to avoid a, a routine of, of things. Michael, good morning. It's a good question that you're asking, and for a few reasons, they might change the den site. Um, so, of course, you know, lions don't tolerate jackals, and if uh, lions figure out where the jackal den site is, they will definitely try and harm those young jackals, and the adults for that matter. So they're just trying to avoid a routine side of things. So rather just switch things up a bit and uh, try not to, to create a routine. And then also, you know, jackals, just like other wildlife, sometimes they do have parasites on their body in the form of ticks and fleas and things like that. And so sometimes it's a good idea just to leave that den site, go to a new area and allow some of those, uh, those parasites just to dissipate. And then when they go back, hopefully it is nice and clean yet again. But we could be wrong. I mean, they could be just really nestled in there. But so far from what I can tell about today, it's, uh, it's clear, clear skies today and it looks like it's going to be quite a warm day again. And as you saw yesterday afternoon, how quickly the conditions can change out here in the Eastern Cape. I was very cold towards the end of the drive yesterday, but when we started the drive, it was piping hot. There's so many different birds calling right now. Probably a little bit too far for you to hear them, but this is the, the morning chorus for the birds. Okay, we're going to decide what our next move is going to be, but in the meantime, I'm going to send you back to Juma in Sabi Sands Game Reserve. Oh wow, okay, then maybe he's probably going to move by the... All right, well, we had a bit of a commotion at the dam. We saw a male waterbuck snorting at something. We've got another waterbuck sitting in the dam, and then we heard the guinea fowls going, and we came across the dam wall, didn't find anything, and then we came back across the dam wall and you can hear there's still quite a lot of commotion and Craig will show you what we found and looky 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 we have the wonderful Marips he's been hanging around all evening uh, what a brilliant 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 way to start the day um, it was seen I think around about three o'clock on the dam cam and here he is He's perched on a log. Uh, we were just trying to debate whether or not the waterbuck being in the water has anything to do with the leopard, but you can see the waterbuck, uh, as you saw, was looking the other way. So we don't think so.
Good morning, Marips. I can hear monkeys alarming. The guinea fowls were going, um, and it was actually the guinea fowls and Craig's ears who helped us find uh, Marips. I don't know if you can hear all the, the geese are making their sort of standard fuss, but there are some monkeys calling in the background. But Marips is just perched on a log next to Gary Dam, and he's eyeing up this water buck in the water. Um, but it might be, well, he's quite capable of taking it down, but it will be a good scalp for him. But we're just trying to debate whether or not this water buck being in the water has anything to do with Marips. We don't think so, because there was a second male water buck here as well. So I think they had a little bit of a territorial. A uh, little skirmish. The other male water buck has disappeared, but Marib seems to be uninterested, really. He's just uh, enjoying the view by the look of it. But he's been hanging around here all evening by the look of it. I know Cedric had him here yesterday, uh, and I was also watching yesterday when he went tearing after that scrub hare. That was a very, very cool sighting, and I particularly liked just how excited uh, Cedric got. Uh, but he does look a little bit skinny. He could use a decent meal. But there's plenty of impala around here in quarantine. In fact, I've driven past impala. There's waterbuck around. There's zebras around. Uh, but yeah, zebra might be a little bit much for him. That being said, I once saw a two-year-old male, so a little bit younger than Marib's, take out a full-grown kudu bull. So never underestimate the power of a leopard. In your fluffy ears, hey? <laughs> He's now looking at this water buck. He's probably wondering, mm, if only I could swim. Maybe you should be a jaguar. If you were a jaguar, maybe you could have a go. I don't know if you can hear the monkeys in the background, that <coughs> noise that they make. We are very, very fortunate. Logan, good morning. Uh, what determines the size? Oh, I think this, the simple answer is, is genetics. Um, oh, look at that. What an athlete. Are oh, you going to lie there, you absolute star? What a poser. Um, it'll just be genetics. Some of it will be inherited from uh, the, the genes of the parents. Um, but I think, to be honest, Logan, that's about all I can give you. I've never heard of any other reason. I mean, you do sometimes get regional differences um, if you lived in a really thick area for example perhaps maybe your rosettes would be more closely packed together sort of evolutionarily speaking uh, just because of the way that um, you know it might offer you slightly better camouflage uh, for example and I'm sort of maybe clutching at straws a bit here but let's take kudu for an example so in this area generally speaking uh, the kudu that we see have quite narrow horns Whereas if you go to an area which is far more open and uh, has less heavily vegetated, then you will find potentially that the kudus will have um, more widespread horns because they get stuck on vegetation um, and it's just easier to move around. So, yeah, but for the size of rosettes, I think we're just going to have to put it down to quite simply genetics on that one. But thank you for the question, Logan, and everybody else. Please do keep those questions coming in and your comments and anything else you'd like to know. What a classic leopard pose. Are you doing some birding, Marips? Maybe he's watching the geese and the lapwings. Uh, sorry, I heard the uh, a comment there about Maribs's whiskers. I didn't hear who it was from, unfortunately. I'm sure Max will let me know in a moment. But you're quite right. They do have very long whiskers. And leopards have the longest whiskers, I think I'm right in saying, of any cat in the world in comparison to their body sizes. I think it's possibly Cliff. Sorry, I'm struggling to, to pick up the comms. Cliff, if it's not Cliff, I apologise. If if whoever that was named sounds very similar to Cliff, then uh, thank you for the comment regardless. But because of the leopard's habitat or habitat preference of quite thick vegetation, remember those whiskers or vibrissae are the, the fancy name for whiskers are sensory organs. They are uh, 
actually wider than the whole body. So if you look at a, a leopard sort of directly front on, you'll see the, the whiskers are wider than the, than the hips or other than, than the shoulders. And that's a brilliant way that when you're moving through the bushes uh, that you can gauge how big a gap is. Are you going to brush the vegetation and make a noise to give away your position? Can you fit through that little gap uh, in between the bushes? And of course those whiskers are actually sort of inset into the uh, into the jaw there or into the skin around the jaw obviously and they're, they're kind of set as like a bubble if you like uh, of fluid or of little blood um, and any sort of sensory information there causes those whiskers to move and uh, remember that uh, vibration travels very very well through fluid so they're very very sensitive to any form of movement and can then be uh, it can then interpret that sensory uh, input. A nice way to sort of think about that is, I don't know if you've ever laid in the bath uh, and if there's a TV on in the other room, and you might not really be able to hear the TV very well, but if you put your head under the water and let the water flood into your ears, then you can hear the TV much more clearly. Yes, it's a bit distorted, of course, but you can hear the uh, the sound waves a lot a lot better because the water the the sound travels better through that thicker medium. Yes, I went about six six days, I think, or six and a half days without seeing a leopard, and I think we've, I've had a leopard every drive that I've been out over the last four days or so. Weird how it goes, but absolutely no complaints from me whatsoever. So fortunate to start the day with this. Leopard lying on a log next to a dam. The stuff the dreams are made of. Look this way, Maritz. Let's have a look at your beautiful face. But you do look a bit skinny, my boy. Dark vein lover, indeed. He does have the fluffiest little ears. It's very, very cute. Um, and yes, he's made the show thus far. Uh, who knows what else we are going to find, though. So this property is incredible. The amount of diversity that we see here, the amount of different predator species that we see here, we are very, very fortunate. Quite why he has fluffy ears. I'm not sure whether, say, his, his parents had particularly fluffy ears. Maybe it's a genetic thing or just... Maybe he just has fluffy ears, but the, those, uh, the hairs in the ears are a very good way of filtering out unnecessary noises. Can you imagine if you're walking through long grass and walking through vegetation, you get this, there's a lot of disturbance and a lot of noise uh, that's sort of going to be constantly coming through the ears, and apparently those hairs are there to filter out that sort of, I suppose you can always call it white noise, and leave those ears available to pick up the really important stuff. Absolutely stunning. What a profile, hey? Are you sleepy, Rips? Um, Angela, good morning. Um, I have no doubt that their paws... Oh, look at that. I have no doubt that their paws are sensitive, uh, but nowhere near so much so as those whiskers certainly you don't you can see a cat if it doesn't if it's walking in in the mud or in wet weather or something shaking off his paws he will certainly pick up information uh, from them but it's not like an elephant for example that we believe can pick up uh, or we know can pick up vibrations from those infrasonic uh, rumbles that elephants give off uh, so I think the entire body will pick up stimuli but I don't think the paws um, any more so than anything else um, obviously the underside of those paws will be relatively sensitive. If you've ever seen a, a cat or a dog that's stuck on a thorn, they'll certainly do about it and they'll try and pick it out with their teeth. But uh, nothing like the sensory input of, uh, say, around the face and those whiskers. 
But the simple answer is, again, I don't know officially, but I've never heard of anything specific uh, to do with their paws. There are suggestions that they have glands in between their toes called interdigital glands, and sometimes when you see, uh, for example, if your cat, if you ever had a cat on your leg and it sort of does that thing where it um, sort of makes a little fist, if you like, and sort of... Um, I don't even know what the right word is, but what would you call that, Craig, if a cat does that? <laughs> you also don't know. But hopefully you know what I mean, when they sort of grab you and they sometimes poke you with their claws through your, uh, through your clothing. Uh, but if you also see a cat sort of stretching up onto a tree, yes, they are taking off those, that sort of waxy cuticle uh, off those claws to keep them nice and sharp. Uh, but there's also suggestions that there are scent glands there uh, just to help with territorial markings and when they are walking uh, through the bush to mark territory. But what an incredible start to the day. Rips, you are a star. Thank you very much, boy. Here at Wild Earth, we know it's not always possible to watch your favorite show live. If catching up on safaris is critical to you, then download the Wild Earth app and watch the catch-ups here first. Catch-ups are available on our app before YouTube. And in addition, there are cut-downs of each show for those who only have time to watch the best bits. <laughs> That's incredibly cute. Download the brand new Wild Earth app today and don't miss out. And good morning from the beautiful and green Karicha. It's another stunning day out here. Animals are out and about doing their thing. And plenty of different species here. I'm Nick. I'm going to be your photo naturalist for today here at Karicha. Yeah, what a stunning way to start the day. Ostrich, Nyala, Impala, Eland at the back. You can see there's quite a few male Nyala in the frame. There must be about uh, five or six of them. And it's been quite interesting to watch how uh, they've kind of been displaying to each other. There's one or two females around. 
I'm hoping they'll put a show on for us now. See, there's the female Nyalas right at the back there. We've got two female ostrich with the greyer plumage. One male ostrich. Corin, in terms of uh, not being able to fly, sure, I think they're, they're very heavy birds. I think weight is going to be quite a big problem, I would imagine. But I'll read up about their, their wing design and things like that, see if there's any reason there. But I would say first and foremost, I would say it's going to be their weight. Let's see, this is the spot to be. I guess in terms of, of the weight of a, of a giraffe, you know, you look at a, at a big male, it's going to be close to around 130 kilos or so. Yeah, that's definitely not small. Oh, lovely. Look at that. See, we've got those two Nyalas close by. In terms of them displaying, I mentioned that they've been displaying to each other a little bit. At the top of the, the back, there's that ridge of hair, that white ridge of hair that gets erected, that stands up straight. And they go into like this, this posture, this stiff-legged walk, where it's basically, it's a, it's a passive show of how big they are. But while we wait for them to do their song and dance, we're going to take you across to Pridelands where there's a sneaky surprise in store. We just saw a leopard, yeah? There it is. There, there, right there. Oh, who, is, who are you? Who are you? I think it's one of Pixie Pan's... I think it's a young male cub. Cody, you got it? I think it's one of Pixie Pan's cubs. What's that bring to mind? Binocular. We had impalas alarming profusely just north, uh, sorry, south of here. There he is, there, he's walking there. And then we just literally bumped into this leopard. We're gonna have to be moving because we're the only people in the sighting, so we're gonna have to maintain it. How's that? We we're actually setting up a sighting or a segment on a plant that we wanted to do. As I said, I feel very educational today. And then we heard these impalas alarming, like, and we just saw this leopard running. There. Okay, let's do a turn that way. Let's see if we can't get another glimpse of it. It's heading towards the copies. Oh, adrenaline stuff. Somewhere there, somewhere there, somewhere. We should gain visual of it soon. Just buy that marula there. The focus, the tense intensity. Hi there, Nathan. Your second leopard for the morning. Well, that is incredible. 
It's our first leopard for the morning. I just need to stay with this animal now. I need to make sure we don't. I think it is Pixie Pan's young male cub. It doesn't look like a very big leopard. It does look like a, a young animal. It was last seen by this marula here. Come, boy, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? of moving was that way yeah okay. let's try this way let's try this way so the terrain is not really favoring us at the moment let's try and go around the sickle bush unless it went down there somewhere but I don't think so Hi there, Sir 50. Sir 50 wants to know if I've ever seen leopard using water to hunt. Um, Sir 50, not truly hunting, but what I have seen in a dam that was drying up, where a leopard male, well known male in Timavati called Manga Jan, which means bat. So he looked like Batman, very dark around his eyes, um, who actually caught catfish. And I witnessed him dragging catfish out of this mud puddle for about two or three days. And he ate them. It just shows you how resourceful these guys are. Got it. There he is. I can see the tail there. Okay, got him. This is going to be rather start stop. The rain is not very favorable for us. And it's thick. But I do see the animal. Somewhere there, I saw him just. Ah, there he is. Once we pass this green bush, we'll. Uh, I think we might have a glimpse here. Maybe through here. Let's check. Straight through there somewhere. It's gonna come out right there by that. What's that, a marula? He's in the tree. He's just jumped up the tree. The diker ran, but he's jumped up the tree there. He's trying to catch something there. This is very weird behavior. Let's go and check it. Check it out. Oh, the terrain is just not great, guys. Yeah, I am gonna get stuck here. Try to climb that small bush, that is amazing. I, th <laughs> I wonder if he didn't get a fright or he got frightened by the daker. Being a young animal, it's, it's quite likely they. Ah, this is gonna backlash. <sighs> yes, this looks. Ah, not the best. Off-roading segment. Sorry, guys. Probably should not be doing this. Ah. Oh. Okay, we're stuck. This is gonna take some undoing here. Right. Let's go over to Ben with my ribs while we try and find our own leopard. Oh, 
excellent work, Chris. It is a spotted cat morning, which is always a good morning. Well, Marib says uh, he's went over the dam wall and then down into the drainage line uh, south of Gary Dam, which is a little inaccessible for us, but we've managed to find a little window of opportunity. And you can see he's just settled down in the grass there and he's having a little bit of a bath. Uh, but he seems to be quite relaxed, but it's interesting that he's been hanging around here since yesterday. Um... Machar, we'll have to see what he does. We'll try and stay with him as long as we can, but he is in a fairly inaccessible spot there. But he does look a little bit hungry. Oh, look at that. He does look a bit hungry. I'm sure he could use a meal. Uh, we're very close to quarantine where there are always plenty of impalas around, so it'll be interesting to see if he sticks around here. Maybe his new plan of attack is to just loiter around the water and wait for an unsuspecting animal to come down and have a drink. Uh, but also in the Stranish line, then we often see Dacre down here. We get Inyala come through. There's a few bushbuck dotted around. And actually, where he is now is exactly where Cedric saw him chase that scrub hare around yesterday. And that incredible camera work from Mpoor to keep up with him through the trees down there. But yeah, he's been lying down here for five or seven minutes now and just seems to be quite happy rolling around, having a little bit of a groom removing any seeds, grass seeds, ectoparasites from the fur, just keeping himself looking beautiful, really. Not that he has to try very hard. Something has attracted his attention. No, nope. and back to bath time. But let's hope he takes up residence around here, close to the dam. It's nice to have seen him. We've seen him quite a lot over the last week or so. And let's hope he's moving in. Leopards for days. Super cool. It seems like we're getting more more leopard sightings there on Pridelands as well. Absolutely fabulous. I'm just around the corner from Sandy Patch and I've stopped to look at these mongoos, but there's so many birds calling. Have a listen and see how many birds you can hear. I think I've counted seven so far. Maybe all these birds are here because I think this is where these dwarf mongoose live up here on this termite mound and maybe they're scuffling through the, through the grass and kicking up insects. There was a Diedrich's cuckoo calling just now, so I've now added it to my birds to frame list. Number one still being a violet black starling, ideally a male, but I'll take either. Anyone know what that one was? Lots of bird activity.
Right, well, Marips is still just enjoying this little bit of low-lying area. It's nestled down in the grass there. Uh, we haven't had much in the way of activity. He seems to have settled in for a little bit of a, a little bit of a snooze, a little bit of a rest, I think. Oh no, head up again. He's very alert. I'm sure he's hungry and he probably just undecided what to do. But strangely, he's been staying here all night and shame he hasn't had any uh, fortune. But obviously, he's been independent for quite a while now and he is obviously quite capable. At some point soon, he's going to have to establish his own territory. Uh, it'll be interesting if he bumps into Mulwati because, of course, we had Mulwati here a few days ago wandering around this area. He was seen on dam cam and we were able to pick him up moving around on quarantine the other day. And, of course, Tavangumi made an appearance last night, which was great. Uh, Owen, good morning. Thanks very much for the question. Um, it's quite normal for a leopard to go, uh, you know, sort of five days or so between feeds. Remember, it's, a lot of it will be dictated by what he last ate. If he had a massive meal, he can afford to have a couple of days of just digesting that food but let's assume that he's just say had have had an impala and he's finished that impala um so they probably kill on average every three days but obviously it's very much dependent but a leopard could go, easily go say a week without eating uh, if it gets to sort of a week and a half to two weeks then it can become a little bit uh, of a problem certainly but leopards are incredibly resourceful i know chris was saying the same thing um, they've been recorded eating so many different uh, prey sources, uh, like uh, we saw Maribs uh, took this that scrub hare yesterday afternoon. I've seen them uh, take Franklins and guinea fowl, so they'll take anything from a sort of a little rodent or a bird, they right the way up to a, a full-grown male kudu. There are even reports of leopards having taken out crocodiles and things. So it's a very difficult um, thing to answer. And then don't forget, they will also scavenge if they find an old kill or something dead in the bush. They've got a very strong uh, stomach acids uh, and they are quite capable of eating that sort of rotting, fetid flesh, a little bit like a hyena. Um, Renato, I think, yes, very likely he, he should know what he's doing by now, but of course it's all a learning curve like all of us. We learn as we go, um, and there are different techniques to hunting different types of animals and different techniques depending on uh, what area you are in. If it's more open, you have to act a little bit more differently than if it is a very heavily vegetated area. But remember, leopards are pretty solitary, um, and leopards learn through trial and error. I've seen it many, many times uh, over the years where mum will leave the cub alone for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. Uh, and during that time, the cub explores and he knows to stay within the bounds of his territory and he knows to stay where mum left him or her because at some point she will come back hopefully with news of some food and take him to uh, a kill that she has made. But during that time, he will experiment. I've seen leopards chasing scrub hares around. I've seen leopards chasing squirrels, playing around with monkeys. Uh, I even had one young leopard that I used to work with or was in a place where I used to work on. I saw him stalking herds of elephants, stalking buffalo, stalking hyenas. Uh, I once saw... Had, had an amazing sighting with a, a young rhino calf, a very young rhino, and this leopard was stalking a, the, uh, the the cow and calf, and it was just lying in the grass, probably only about 10 metres from these things, obviously just practising and playing in that sort of classic instinctual method of cats. And this little baby rhino obviously smelt or heard something and came snuffling towards the leopard uh, and got to within probably less than a metre, and suddenly this young leopard jumped out of the grass and swatted... Um, the uh, swatted the rhino across the face which of course made the rhino squeal and then mum came flying through and we had to be a little bit careful of her um, but they do do what they can I mean they'll practice as they go sorry I'm just being distracted because he's moving now and I'm just trying to see whether or which way he is going to go if we can potentially find a route in let's have a look uh, so he will always learn, and he'll always be learning. Let's want to see where he went. You go down the drainage line there, Craig. OK. 
Okay. He's going down the drainage. I'm hoping he's going to pop out on Gary Cutline. Just trying to keep long distance visual. But I think it looks like he is moving east, which might mean he pops out onto the road up here. Let's cross our fingers. But yes, so leopards are incredibly resourceful, that, that is for sure. They can occupy so many different types of habitat uh, and they will eat pretty much anything. I'm sorry, Max, you're breaking up. I think that was from Kenny. Kenny, if, if it is you, thank you for the question. Um, well, yeah, I suppose eventually you'll have to conserve a little bit of that energy if he's not eating well. Um, certainly won't necessarily be sprinting after things the whole time. Uh, but you've got to eat. You've got to take that risk. Uh, otherwise, you may find yourself in dire need. Ginny. Sorry, Ginny. Um, so you may not uh, sort of take unnecessary risks. It might be a more calculated approach in order to save uh, energy and not waste too much, especially if they haven't eaten for a little while. Uh, but hard to say. Um, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes. Uh, but certainly they will need to conserve a little bit of energy. Of course, they will start to use their fat reserves uh, as well, so that's why their leopards tend to start getting a little bit skinnier. Yeah, just trying to see if he's going to pop out somewhere here. No sign of him yet. He was moving down the drainage line, but looked as if he was coming in a southerly direction. Okay, we've got another vehicle who says they saw him going this way still. Oh, but I'm so chuffed, eh? So chuffed. So lucky to see so many leopards in this place. You guys are very fortunate as well. And to see so many different leopards, that's the amazing thing. I cannot believe how many different leopards we see in what is relatively a relatively small area here. Let's just see if we can see anything from the wall here. It's always difficult. This is classic leopard behaviour, moving along through a drainage line. I always call drainage line sort of leopard highways. Um, but it does mean it's quite difficult for us to follow him. Let's see if we can get any view. Let me know if you see anything there, Craig, but I doubt it. I think it's a little bit too steep. Might be able to hear the go-away birds calling. That's a good indication of approximately where he is. That You can hear squirrels alarming now as well. All right, we're going to see if we can find Marips again. Um, in the meantime, let's send you over to Nick in Kureja. And we've got ourselves a beautiful raptor here. This is a jackal buzzard. He's just facing away from us, so you can see that uh, that darker plumage on his back there. Let's just wait and see if he does shift around for us. So you would have a beautiful sort of mottled rufous chest area. 
Shame he's been having such a tough time this morning. I've been trying to get a a beautiful shot of him for you, and at long last we've got it. He's been um, dive bombed by common fiscals, fiscal shrikes the whole morning. He'll sit down in a position like this on a different tree, and he's. Uh, these fiscals, these common fiscals come and mock him. They come and dive bomb him. They try and chase him out of the area. Which is quite a quite a common behavior um, in terms of smaller birds trying to chase off these bigger birds. You know, reasons could be, uh, you know, these bigger raptors, not just jackal buzzards, but even, you know, things like yaddable kites, which we'll find here at the moment. They might look to even catch these smaller birds. So the smaller birds are basically warning them, saying, you know, get out here. If they pester them long enough, they may they may chase them away. You know, if there's a pair of birds that have maybe got uh, some little chicks or they've got a nest close by, they don't want a big raptor like this hanging around. Anthony, thanks for the question. In terms of prey species that this jackal buzzard's going to look to hunt, it's it's going to be quite opportunistic. Um, you know, if, if there's any carcasses around, it'll definitely eat some meat from the carcass. Uh, coming into summer now, when we've got uh, lots of rains and things like that, um, and obviously our, our, our termites um, start to move out and about, um, you know, with different uh, humidities and things like that, they'll look to catch termites. There we go. There's our fiscal dive bombed them. <laughs> Shame. Um, but in terms of other foods they, they might eat, uh, they might they might actively kill prey species such as small little hares. Um, you know, obviously we talked about birds. They'll they'll catch birds, uh, frogs. You might even catch some frogs, especially now coming into the summer season. Um, and even small little reptiles, small little uh, lizards and things like that. Um, snakes, you know, we mentioned, when was that now? Two days ago, I saw some, I saw two snakes moving around and about. He looked to catch snakes. So a variety of different, different things he would look to catch. The Explorers program brings nature lovers together and helps share authentic wildlife experiences with the world. Explorers receive so many great benefits, including a chance to watch completely ad-free, luxury travel prizes, access to behind-the-scenes content, and don't forget the weekly newsletter filled with inside information. Explorer subscriptions are available in monthly, six-monthly, and yearly on our website.
this is so cool. I just found some Shelley's Franklins. I don't think I've ever managed to frame these birds before. And this bird has stayed up on this log for us. It's really difficult to follow them in this sort of, this grass is quite long. And it's been standing up on this little open log for about a minute and a half. I don't think I've, I've, I didn't have them on my bird list. I've heard them, but they normally sort of skulk around in the, in the long grass, in the thickets. Shelley's Franklin. Very cool. Oh, it's standing there so nicely for us. I actually just, it was calling. It was stood up there calling as well. What a beautiful image of these Franklin. There's another one just sort of down and to the left a little bit. Not as easy to see, to see those feathers scuffling around there. What a lovely shot. Thank you, little Franklin. Shelley's Franklins. Okay, I'm going to carry on. I'm on Impala Road. Hello, little guy. Thank you. That's very cool. I've never framed a Shelley's Franklin before. Hannah, what a brilliant question. How often do they regrow their feathers? It depends on um, conditions. I'm not sure what the official lifespan of a feather is. Um, if they've been through harsh conditions, because I'm sure you've been shown before, I'll see if I can find a nice one to show you, Hannah. Um, feathers, especially flight feathers, they sort of zip and unzip. They've got like a ziplock mechanism on them. Um, and if you, if they sort of, if you pull them downwards, it sort of un, unzips and then you pull it up and it zips up again. And when that mechanism isn't working nicely anymore, um, then they will shed, especially those flight feathers, um, and they will replace them with nice new zippy feathers. Um, I'm not, sh I'm not sure what the lifespan of a flight feather is. I would say it depends on weather conditions. If it's been very wet and very dusty, um, and there's been more damage done to those feathers, it won't be quite as long. But I'm actually gonna find out how long an average feather lasts for. Good question. So as, as per usual, I think it, it varies. I would imagine also like how healthy the bird is because they would have to produce the, um, the all the goodness from their from their bodies to actually grow those feathers in the first place so i'm sure if they were getting lots of nutrients and food they would have more body power to um produce nice new feathers on a on a regular basis and the time of you oh dung beetle oh no he's gonna run off into the into the bushes i had a fantastic dung beetle sighting yesterday Rolling an oblong ball. Oh, it's gonna lose him. Is he gonna go back? Oh, sorry, beetle. Is he gonna come back? See, it looks like there's some poo there that's been worked on. Maybe we disturbed him. Maybe he felt the vibrations of the car and decided to abandon his project, which would be very sad. So I hope he's come back to it. Someone also asked me yesterday. Hey, there we go. Um, someone also asked me yesterday, um, apart from elephants, who communicates by vibrations? And I didn't even think of, of ants and, and termites. Ants are um, hugely reliant on, on vibrations and they actually spend a lot of time communicating by tapping the floor, tapping each other. Um, so I suppose that would be classes as vibration. So how cool is that, that everything from elephants to ants use vibrations and I'm sure there's lots of things we don't know about that use vibrations as well. What's the plan, Beetle? 
I could watch these dung beetles for hours. And I know lots of people feel the same. No, didn't like that bit. Where are you off to? There's so many different groups and groups, families, species, whatever you want to call them, of certainly of beetles um, and even of dung beetles. There's thousands. And I have got an insect book that gives us clues of the most common ones. Sorry, you've got that jack in the way there. And Paul, let me, oh, let me see if I can roll back a little bit. And is that a bit better? Try from there. Obviously, didn't like that other little poo on the left. Alex, I don't think so. I don't think they can roll multiple balls at once. They will roll multiple balls, um, but not at once. It would be like spinning plates, I think. Um, so from what I understand, they, they, they form a ball, build a ball, take it off, bury it, or whatever it is they're going to do with it, and then they will move on to the next one. So while they might have multiple balls, um, I don't think they can make more than one at once. Don't come too close to the car, little beetle. Where are you? I'm gonna... I don't want this beetle to come under the car, so I think I'm gonna scoot round him here. Obviously, undecided. Where's he gone? Can't see him now, where did he go? Can you, you can't see him there, can you, Uncle? How can I lose a dung beetle from under the car? Okay, well, I think I'm just going to... He's not in any of these tyre tracks, because I would see. So I'm going to scoot over here. And carry on down in Parlour Road. <laughs> Jasmine, you guys! You come up with the most amazing questions and things that I've never even thought of. Um, I suppose physically, yes. Um, whether or not it's ever happened, I doubt, but I'm not going to say it's never happened because we just don't know. Um, but, I mean, they've got the same legs and I'm sure they're just as strong as the male dung beetles so physically I would say yes she probably could but probably doesn't would be my response to that I think but good question Jasmine I spend lots of time pondering intricacies and I find myself getting lost I'll think of I wonder if XYZ and then I end up going oh but what about this and I end up two hours later somewhere in the depths of my books and the internet somewhere Kimberly I know there's definitely one species that is protected and I think it's the ooh so my memory right I think it's the ad I think they could I don't know if they're called the Addo flightless dung beetle or something else, but they're the flightless dung beetles you find in Addo. Um, and I'm pretty sure they are protected. There might be other species that are protected as well. Um, like I said, there's thousands, thousands of... Uh, I think um, the, the group that beetles belong to, Coleoptera, um, has, got the, what is that? has got the highest diversity of different things in it than uh, or taxonomic classification than anything else um, here. It's just so wide and varied. Um, I don't know of anything else that's protected, but of all those dung beetles that exist, I'm sure there's a Koran over there. Um, I'm sure there maybe are other species that are protected. There's a Koran over here, stood nicely up on a 
on a termite mound. I want to try and show you. Up on that termite mound just there. Left. That's it. In, in, in. There he is. In between those trees. Oh, I thought he was going to go then. Are you ready for He might go. I challenged him for. Oh no, it was Panda actually, to uh, manage to frame one of these birds displaying. Come on, move a little bit be from behind those sticks. Birding for days this morning. Let's see if this Koran is going to give us a display. Panda challenged me back to frame a red crested Koran with its crest up. Come on. They will call from anywhere, but you often see them on these sort of higher points. And they're displaying. It's a uh, you know, it's a nice, high, showy-offy point. Is he going to go again? Give him another few seconds to see if he's going to call again. There we go. Can you hear that? No display. The other cool bird we see here sometimes is um, the black bellied Koran. Black bellied. Bustards are uh, sometimes nicknamed a champagne bird and they will go Whoop. Actually, maybe I'll play you it. It'll probably be slightly more realistic. Oh, one more, one more, one more. Hannah, how many eggs can a red crested Koran lay at one time? <sighs> Again, oh, just listen to this click. No, he's not going to go. <laughs> one day. Um, Hannah, they don't lay too many. Um, probably no more than two, maybe three at a push, normally one or two. Um, and they'll lay them on the, on the ground. So they're, they're not one of these birds that lays these huge clutches of eggs. And I think we were talking about Birds' feathers, like I said, um, varies on various conditions, but I was, the more I've been thinking about it, maybe around about 12 months. I am going to carry on. I don't think this quarrel is going to display for us, but I think Ben might have a rare sighting for us with him.
Go onto that mound. Go onto that termite mound and lie down, please, boy. All right, welcome back, everyone. Well, Maribs has led us on a merry dance again. I seem to be having some great leopard luck, and it's nice to see mobile leopards, but oof, they've been keeping us on our toes. Uh, but we do have him still. Um, we're, I don't even know where we are now, to be honest. We're somewhere between Central and Vulture's Nest, I think. Uh, but he's been meandering through the bushes. We haven't really sort of stopped for any other reason just to have a little groom here and there, but there is a termite mound in front of us up here, and I'm really hoping he's going to maybe go up there and uh, take the vantage point, because he has been moving for quite a while now, but it looks like he is going to continue on straight. So I think we're going to have to keep going. I think uh, it's getting quite thick in here now, so at some point I think we're going to leave him in peace, because again, as, as a from a personal ethic point of view as well. I think you know, after a while, these animals do deserve a little bit of um, peace and quiet, especially when they're on the move here. If he was to be hunting, and he is hungry, uh, I'm sure, well, we are not helping masses. But it's stunning to see the, the young prince here. Very, very grateful for it. And uh, so that was such a great start to the morning. So the, the water buck was in the dam there, and then to have him lounging on the log next to the dam was spectacular. But interesting to see how much he's exploring. We're obviously a little bit young still to, to hold his own territory as such. And this is very much Mulawati's territory, so we won't be seeing him scent marking. We won't hear him soaring or roaring. Ah, oh, we're going to lie down. Okay. Because uh, he's he's going to be flying under the radar pretty much, uh, but very very cool to see. I'm chuffed to bits. Um, okay, I'm just going to see. If there's another vehicle with us. So I'm just going to let them get in there and go stationary, and then we'll see if we can find a, a view and see him where he's lying down there. Uh, we try where possible to only have one vehicle moving, uh, just to avoid unnecessary excessive disturbance. So we'll just let that other vehicle move into position and then we'll see if we can do anything. But you can see he's laid down in that very long grass, so I don't know if we're going to get a fantastic view. Uh, morning, Nicole. Uh, very difficult to tell you. It depends what, the, what it, the leopard's plan is. If he's doing a territorial patrol, he might cover 20, 30 kilometres in a day. Um, if he starts hunting, uh, then he may not travel very far and he may be able to get something within a few hundred metres and then stay there for a while. So uh, it very much depends on the leopard. Males will travel further than females. Oh, no, we're off again. Uh, because he has, uh, males have much larger territories than females, so they will put more distance under those paws than a female would do. Um, but yeah, I think sort of from what I've heard, a really big amount of walking in a day would be potentially up to 30 kilometres, and that is a long way. Um, I know I've tracked lions over 40 kilometres before where they moved in one night, so if they, if they need to, and if they're doing these territorial patrols, they can go huge distances. Um, but it's going to be dependent on a lot of different factors, as always. Sorry, I know we often give you that answer, where it's, oh, it depends on the variables, but it really is true. Um, nature is not finite, unfortunately. All right, let's see if we can stay with him. But if it gets any thicker, I think we may abandon him uh, just for the sake of the environment and also for a little bit of privacy for him as well. Uh, and the last thing I want to do is, is affect his fortunes in terms of a hunt. I'm not quite sure what his plans are. I don't think he's necessarily hunting as such, but uh, he looks hungry, so if he saw something, I have no doubt that he would do. Um, Francine, he's still a little bit young to have established a, a full-blooded territory because this is currently Mawati's territory and obviously the, the core of Juma. We have uh, Tavangumi pops in up in the north and the west, Tortoise Pan in the, the south and the west, but the majority of Juma is owned by Mawati. So he's got two options really. He's either going to have to take on 
one of those leopards, which I would not suggest yet because he is not fully grown yet. He's not beefed up enough to be able to take on a, a full grown, well established leopard like that. Uh, or he would have to move further afield to find an empty territory, which is also unlikely in an area of very, very high leopard density. So pretty much for the next year or two, until he gets to about four or five years of age when he will be beefed up enough to potentially take on um, a big male, this is what he's going to do. He's just going to kind of stay under the radar and skulk around and uh, hunt where he can, survive where he can, be basically nomadic uh, until he has that opportunity to hold a territory. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes a bit further afield. He was born in this area. Um, and generally speaking, male leopards do move away a little bit from the area that they were born, and that's sort of nature's design in terms of <laughs> looking up. I'm so used to having a roof on at the moment, folks expecting to have to negotiate with the roof. Um, that they will often go further afield, as I say, for nature's way of avoiding inbreeding um, and, ge and increasing genetic diversity. Okay, we're going to see if we can get another view of him, but he's on the march again, so we will let you know how we go. We really have been getting all the birds this morning. I very much enjoyed those Shelley's Franklin. I'm on uh, the southern end of Impala Road. I'm going to loop around uh, Valonites. I'm, I'm secretly hoping that we maybe bump into big girl Shadulu. But it's a lovely morning. It's nice and cool, a little bit overcast, but it seems we're getting lots of activity this morning. Juma is greening up beautifully with this little bit of rain and I think we've got some more coming soon. This is not far from where we had Shadulu a couple of mornings ago. She was making beelines between those um, termite mounds as her name suggests. So I'm keeping a close eye on these termite mounds. Lily Pan, I agree. There's been so much happening and so many different things. Um, there's been leopards and, and birds and beetles and all sorts of things. And there was a lovely scene, I think, in Amakala there with Eland and ostrich. Diversity is indeed the spice of life, Lily Pan. There has been elephants all over the place that everywhere is littered with <laughs> where elephants have been digging down at the root of, of uh, bushes get to those roots there's branches strewn everywhere well <laughs> the adventure continues uh, he's just popped out onto Vulture's Nest and crossed straight east. So we'll be able to give you a visual in about 10 seconds. I think Craig off to our left here. So yeah, he's crossed, he's, he's now in, bet in between Vulture's Nest and Anyala Road South, but we are most definitely on a mission. Yeah, it just disappears in that grass. It's absolutely incredible. You'd never know he was here. It's so much good fortune and so we drove over that damn wall and he definitely wasn't where he was. And I literally went over the damn wall, I turned around, came back across that damn wall, what, maybe 30 seconds later, and bam, there's a leopard sitting there. Ooh, leopard girl, that's a good question. Um, 
Unfortunately, I'm going to have to just say I don't know. I don't think STDs are a problem amongst cats. I mean, you do get feline AIDS as a thing. Um, and obviously there's the other things like TB, but that's not passed through through mating or anything. Uh, Libby girl's a good question. I, I honestly don't know. The only When you said STD, the only thing that popped into my head is we know that um, koalas, for example, have a problem with chlamydia. Um, I've never heard of, you know, any of the other classic STDs cropping up in these animals, but I think that's maybe more of a, a veterinary question, I'm afraid. But uh, good question. Uh, they don't certainly don't use protection. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if maybe they could pick it up and sort of sense it and avoid somebody who does have a problem like that. I mean, that does happen in nature sometimes. Uh, I don't know, Leopard Girl, good question. I will see if I can find anything out for you, but I've never heard of anything along those lines, certainly. You guys do keep us on on our toes with these questions. Please do keep them coming in, because it, you know, we, we've seen so many, it seems silly to say, but we've seen so many leopards over the years, um, but you guys ask us questions to go and research things that we would never otherwise think to sort of go and look up. Um, I do have a friend who is a wildlife vet, so I, maybe I'll drop him a note. If if anybody listening does know the answer, if we have any budding vets or anybody who's done some sort of research into this area, I would be fascinated to know whether leopards or lions or any of the cats, for that matter, are susceptible to any STDs. But it's nothing I've ever heard of. So, yeah, if you do know, please do let us know. Right, he's just gone... He's just going past this marula. I think he's just having a sniff. There's a big termite mound here. Let's hope that he just decides to go and have a rest in that classic leopard fashion of rising up a termite mound. It looks like he might do. That's going to give him plenty of space so that we don't disturb him. And then hopefully, 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 he will lie down on the top and we can get a nice view from of him here. But I think he is on the hunt. He's looking for anything. I was going to try and get in front of him for you, quick. Yeah, he's gonna. It looks like he's gonna pop down there. Let's try and just come round to the left here, Craig, and get side on to him. Now you look back at me. Thanks, for ribs. But I can look at him. He's still got a very pink nose. You've still got some growing up and some bulking up to do, my boy, haven't you? But you are pretty as a picture. Oof. There we go. Reward for all of that hard work going through the bushes. We end up with that. Just perfection. I don't think he's going to stay here for long. I think he's most definitely on the move this morning. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> he's keeping us busy. But at least it's a little bit more open in here. It's a lot easier to follow. And the other nice thing is that the other vehicles have uh, the other vehicles have moved away, so we have them all to ourselves at the moment, which actually makes me feel better as well. Uh, because we're not causing so much noise. Okay, I think we're going to see if we can stay with him, but if he goes into the thick stuff again, I think so, out of uh, ethical consideration, I'm going to leave him if we... I don't want to go smashing through the undergrowth unnecessarily. We followed him for a long time, but let's send you across to Nick in the meantime. And from a mobile Marips possibly going into some thick areas to some giraffes right out in the open for us. Stunning scene here. So we're just on the edge of Scotia Dam here. And uh, yeah, these giraffes have slowly filtered out from the thickets into the clearings and they're putting on a beautiful show for us here. So you can see these two closest to us 
This is a nice big male on the right hand side and a female slightly just on his left there. And it looks like right in the distance at the back that's a second female. Oh no, having a having a close look at it. Yeah, I was looking at the horns there and you could see there's tufts of uh, tufts of hair at the top of the horns. It might actually be a young male. But yeah, you can see we've got this beautiful light coming uh, obviously from the east and just bathing them in this lovely gorgeous color here. So in terms of 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 a beautiful photograph here, we can see that background is nice and dark. Um, helping you know for for these giraffes just to pop out so just before you you came from having a look um, at Marips to joining us here at Kariha that giraffe in the distance that was actually faced the other way uh, so facing to the left hand side of the frame um, and it's amazing how just the positioning of that giraffe at the back helped to create so much more symmetry for the photo you know, it, your eye moved naturally from sort of the bottom right hand side of the frame diagonally going up to the left and uh, yeah, it, it just flowed so much better, it was actually amazing to see. In terms of what that male was doing there, Taylor made thanks for the question. Yeah, I was just about to chat about what's going on there. So, you know, we talked about this this giraffe at the back closest to us. That's a big male. So, in terms of for him, if he wanted to figure out and see if, if, if a female is potentially ready to mate in estrus he would uh, he kind of stand at the back like he's doing there and you know kind of uh, have some form of body contact on the female and you see what he's doing there how his, his lips are curling back so that other giraffe is urinated and he's able to assess um, a whole lot of information from that you know in terms of if it was a female whether she's uh, you know ready to mate if it's a, if it's a male which it looks like yeah, a young male he'll be able to tell the condition of that animal so he's basically having a look to see what the situation is it's very interesting behavior that I was actually hoping he was going to do that for us yeah I feel like uh, let's say that that was a female a whole lot easier for humans to you know go to the bar buy a lady a drink and you know take it from there whereas for giraffes they've got to swirl a bit of urine around in their mouth a little bit of a different technique but i guess if it uh, if it works for him it works for him the end justifies the means While these giraffes are doing their unusual thing of uh, checking out the, the condition of other giraffes, let's take you across to Kelly who's also got something unusual. We've got a huge millipede here. It's just ducked behind this grass a bit. Let me try. Oh, do you think forward, Paul? Let me try go forward. It's enormous. I'm just going to slowly creep round here. There we go. This is difficult to get a perspective of this, but this millipede must be 12 centimetres. That's very specific. But my point is it's quite big. 
And the name millipede literally means a thousand legs. However, these millipedes do not have a thousand legs. I had a very slow summer a few years ago and uh, a few of us spent some time counting the legs on these uh, millipedes. It turns out they've got two pairs of legs per segment. So if you can count these segments, I don't rate your chances of doing it from there. Um, but I think we counted three millipedes. We counted their segments and times it, and I think they averaged out at about 270 legs. Um, so yeah, a bit of a bit of a slow slow summer. Um, so they're uh, detrivores. They play a very important role in uh, the recycling of things, um, dead material, rotting vegetation, fungus, and they sort of basically spit on their food and then chew it, um, just to help with that digestion. We're seeing lots of them, but often they're on the road, but this, um, this millipede is up on this lovely big termite mound. And it's really nice seeing them in the summer. It's great fun. All these critters and crawlies and creepies come out. And it keeps us on our toes because they're, oh, the numbers of arthropods and, and insects and, and bugs and critters. Um, it's, it's growing constantly. It's growing all the time. It secretes uh, different chemicals to prevent attack because, as you, as you can imagine, this is a 12 centimetre snack. Pretty boy. Um, they've got sort of, uh, their legs are sort of split funny at the front, but they've basically got antenna and they feel with their feet as well. And, okay, it's gone right in this grass now. Um, but they don't they don't move quickly and they've got well they've got 270 little little oh there's another one coming out ha huh, just to the right there Paul wow that looks like that one has gone in a hole and the other one's come out the other side it's two different millipedes oh you can see how its feet are sort of rippling i don't know how close you can get in there they use this like rippling effect and that's you can see uh, this is exactly how they feel their way around they've got a an entire rippling sensory base that they use. And maybe... No, I don't think they would. This is a, a fungus growing termite termite mound. And they do feed on fungus. But no, I think they've probably just been sheltering in here. I haven't heard of them feeding on the fungus that... Um, this specific fungus that termites are related to. There's a whole... There's a whole millipede party going on here. So they do secrete chemicals to prevent them from being a 12 centimetre snack. Um, but they're a favourite of, of scorpions and um, civets. Civets really enjoy these guys as well. And you often see in civet trees, so the latrine of a civet, um, civet poop, is full of these. Oh, it's quite mesmeric actually. Millipede hypnosis. Looks like there's an electric pulse going along it. They're amazing, these just going about their day. I've got a bee flying around as well. They must be, they must be foraging. I'm sure they're looking for food. They're tapping those, their, their, their antenna, basically, on the front. And it's like a, um, like a, sen like a sensory organ, almost like cat's whiskers. And they will be feeling their way around there. 
Ha, huh, this is very, very cool. I'm going to send you over to Pridelands, who I think have their own party on the go over there. Definitely not the only party going on at the moment. And you're not in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. We're just focused on a bit of a grass. But that is not our story here. If we go a little bit further, like I said this morning, I feel very educational today. Right. My story here is, what's in a name? What's in a name? We have the Weeping Wattle, the African Weeping Wattle. Yeah. Why the Weeping Wattle? Right, so in summertime, especially when there's young branches growing, you often will stand under this tree and you'll feel water or a fluid dripping from above, especially with the taller versions of this tree, the taller specimens. Weeping wattle, tree is crying. Right, so what you have is the nymph and larval stage of a type of spittle bug, also called frog hoppers. So what they do, they've got this structure here just below the head area called a rostrum or a stylum which drills into the young branchlets for instance the one I'm holding here and they basically drink they drink the plant juices and they filter them filter the proteins especially and nutrients but there's not a lot of protein in there so they have to do a lot then they often congregate in a bunch so their excrement or their excreta will basically be quite water rich and it will also bubble up in a froth around them and from there you'll have that sort of fluid dripping hence the name spittle bugs and creating the image as if the tree is crying now if you stand under the tree you'll feel that water dripping why would they do it? So basically that froth around them protects them from predators as well. It keeps them moist.
Okay, so we've still got our three giraffes here. And you can see they've repositioned slightly. So you see how earlier we were talking about for that for that photograph, how we had two facing to the left hand side of the frame and we had one looking to the right. And now obviously they've shifted position, they're all looking to the right. You can see how much easier it is on the eye when you look at that as a photograph, how it just kind of flows. So they're starting to read the script for us here. Waikisha, thanks for the question. In terms of differentiating male from female giraffes, uh, one of the ways we can do that is to look at the horns. So the width of the horns of a male will be thicker and wider than that of a female's. Female have slender, elegant horns. And then at the top of a female's horns, there'll be tufts of black hair quite often. Uh, and for a male, he should be bald on top of those horns. That's for when giraffes are, are fully developed, when they're fully grown. When they're younger and, and still growing, you can't really use that as a safe option. You've, you've got to kind of look between the legs a bit then. Um, that's why earlier when we were talking about that, that young male, young males may have black tufts of hair on top of their horns, which make them look potentially like females, but those horns will be quite thick, they'll be quite wide, which is kind of the, the giveaway. And then in terms of, of color, quite often for the males, the older the males get, they can darken with color. Whereas females will generally stay more of like a caramel type of color. But I guess then you do get just genetic differences. You can get a female giraffe that is genetically dark. But I mean, as a general rule of thumb, males will be darker in color than that of females. Let me see if I can try and zoom into this uh, this giraffe at the back for you here. So that one that's slightly on the left hand side, I want to show you his horns there. Can you see how, how his horns are, are bald at the top there? He doesn't have any hair at the top of those horns there. So that's telling us that, that he's a male. And you can see, look at the size of his shoulder there. He's got a big, big shoulder. You know, that's going to be much larger than that of any female as well. Everybody chewing rhythmically. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if, uh, you know, where I'm parked right now is a little distance away from them, but, <laughs> you know, when we were zoomed in like that and you could see all of their miles going at the same time, if you know, if we could hold like a microphone towards each of their faces, then see if we could get the sound, the audio of them chewing, if they'd be, if they'd be whacking it out in, in synchrony there. But yeah, I mean, in terms of noises, giraffes don't, don't generally make too many noises. You know, some people think that they, they're mute. They're definitely not mute. They're able to make noises and things like that, but uh, not very vocal animals, huh?
Mandy, in terms of uh, giraffes being bitten by spiders while browsing, you're thinking out the box there, my word. I've never actually thought of that before. I'm sure there's the potential chance, you know, there's plenty of different species of spiders and things that we get out here. Um, yeah, there's definitely the potential chance. However, however, I mean, it's important to remember that the resilience of all of these animals out here is incredible. You know, something that would be quite fatal for us is, is nothing for a lot of these animals. Um, you know, so I guess even if a, a giraffe did have to get bitten by a spider, it, it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. In South Africa that I know of, we have eight highly uh, sort of venomous spiders. So if you think of the, the sheer number of spiders that we do get in South Africa, and if you've only got eight that are that is kind of venomous, poisonous, um, eight's not the, not the highest number in the world. I haven't heard of a of a giraffe dying or anything like that from from being bitten by a spider, but I'll definitely do some reading on it, see if I can find anything. Yeah, talking about spiders, I'm not a big fan, huh? My dad, he got bitten by a violent spider. We were playing golf. I hit my ball on the fairway, obviously, from the drive. I mean, obviously. And my dad hit his in the rough. And he got bitten by a violent spider. He didn't know it at the time. He just felt this little prick on his ankle. And it wasn't the best thing. But thankfully for the moment, no spiders around here. Just zebras and giraffes. But let's take you across to Ben and see if he's had any more luck with the leopard. Well, um, it seems that despite uh, our, my best efforts to leave Marips, he, he determined to be a part of the show this morning. Uh, we've just bumped into him on Battle Ear. If you just bear with me a second, everybody. Sorry, there was another car who was very interested to find him again, so I just want to let them know. Uh, yeah, we've got Marips again. Three brothers, named the Avoca males, arrived in Juma in 2018. So this is our first good look at the Avoca males, so they're definitely a bit older than what I thought when we were looking at them. They're just under five. This area had recently been vacated by the Birmingham boys. The Avocas grabbed the opportunity and took over the Talamati and Nkohuma prize quickly. In 2019, they were seen mating with females from both prides and went on to sire cubs with them. And we are very privileged to be watching the Nkohuma pride as the sun comes up. The most recognizable lion in this coalition is Dark Mane. Aside from the dark mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp. This limp stems from an injury to his right leg he sustained while taking down a buffalo with the Inkohuma pride. Sorry about that there, but uh, we've got another lovely scene here. And we've got some buffaloes that have come down to a little mud wallow here. That's all happening here at Kariha this morning. We've got giraffes, we've got zebras, we've now got buffaloes coming down to the, the, the water here. Getting myself tongue twisted along the way. See if I can zoom out here and get some of those little calves in the shot. Look at that. The importance of medicinal plant that we have in the surrounding. Remember, all different plants in the area, it cure different diseases that might be really amazing to human beings. The importance of this specific plant, it do treat pneumonia, 
And of course, if you have a flu, and it's one of the best toilet paper tree out in the bush, because it does have the very soft leaves. These trees are very common. You can find in anywhere, cover most of the ground in the area. The most important plant is devil thorn. Devil thorn is one of the thorn that uh, when a woman is in labor, they use the devil thorn to be free from giving birth and also use this as a soap. You can be free from bacteria. Right, well, sorry, uh, you lost your buffalo, but we will see your buffalo and raise you a leopard. So, Rips is still lounging on this termite mound, all stretched out. He's still very much alert, but it looks like we are having a little breather. But, yeah, he has been on a mission. He's gone all the way from Gary Dam, where we found him this morning. We are now in between Battleir and Drachensich, and the other side of Drachensich is Cheetah Cutline, and then into Torchwood. So he's nearly walked through all the way from Gary Cutline to our eastern boundary this morning. Uh, has been unsuccessful on his... How's it going, Wild Earth? My name is Igor. I'm a camera operator for Penguin Beach. I've been a camera operator for almost 10 years now. What I love the most about working at Wild Earth is the amount of time that I get to spend in nature and observing animals in their natural environment. Not only that, but actually being able to see animals as they grow up. But when I'm not working on Wild Earth, what I love the most is to spend time in nature. I jump in the sea as often as I can. I take hikes. So I love being in the sea, I love being in the mountains, I love being in the desert. So I try and do that as much as I possibly can. The thing I love most about these African penguins is actually their character. If you look at the attitude that they actually have while going about their business, it is just the best thing. The questions I love getting the most from viewers are very thoughtful questions. Questions born out of genuine curiosity and a love and a passion for coastal wildlife. Bumbling, right. So we are continuing. There was reports of wild dogs close to Eco training Pridelands camp. Um, we're not really close to it, but it's possibly worthwhile heading into that direction to try and follow up on that report. Apparently, quite a brief visual, and they ran westwards towards where we are now. So that's what I'm trying to just check out at the moment. See if we can't add the dogs to our tally this morning. Other than that, um, some lovely leopard. <laughs> anyway, I believe that uh, it might have been a little awkward with me not being in sync. Just an apology for that. It does happen. We are out here in the African woods. And things do go wrong at times. But let's put that behind us. We are here, we are looking for the dogs. Just probing, really. I'm just literally trying to figure out what they've done. More with the hope of potentially setting up a sighting for this afternoon. So we've got Kili Kopi right here, and they said they were heading straight towards there. It's a long shot, you know, it's, it's one of those where you can't really, you just have to work the area. It's like I always say, if you understand the problem, you can work the solution. The outcome might not always be in your favor though. And the problem that we sit with, and that we understand is that tracking is difficult at the moment. We will not see wild dog tracks on the road. With the rains, soil bonds, not a lot of loose dust and soil particles where the paw print can actually imprint. It's just like concrete at the moment. So unless they run and there's claws or anything like that, or a heavy animal like a buffalo, you won't see tracks. 
So we need a few days without rain. So the top layer, the thin little top layer of soil particles need to dry out. Needs to loosen up. And then we will start to see drugs. Talking about buffalo, let's go over to Nick, who apparently might have some buffalo for us. So if you've ever wondered what the face of contentment for a buffalo looks like <laughs> this cow in the water is putting it on full display for us <laughs> yeah i think she's just loving it huh um you can see her ruminating away there obviously that water's nice and cool and that's just hitting the spot for her It's incredible how most of the herd is kind of just up on the bank to the left. You can see a male starting to, to come across here. But how, how most of them have actually not come into the water. Uh, off he goes. I thought he was going to come down to the water for us. Look at that youngster there resting his head on that bank there. Don't work harder, work sm work smarter. Oh, life is good. Scratching that itch. Another one at the back there scratching his chin. Everybody's got the itches. Remember there were lots of those little midges flying around yesterday. Not as many today. But um, you would think that if there was plenty of them around today, maybe the, these buffaloes would, uh, would coat themselves in this mud rather than, you know, uh, scratching up against grasses and things like that. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been bitten by a tick. But it, it, even if you pull that tick off, it can be quite itchy still. Um, obviously, these buffaloes would have the ox pickers to help them. But having a good scratch up against uh, a tree or a nice thick patch of grass like they've got here will always hit the spot as well. So remember in terms of, of a precious resource, like a small little water hole like this, everything is, is going to be based off of a sort of a size hierarchy. So let's say a single rhino bull had to come in now and we've got, you know, a herd of buffalo here at the water. He's more than likely going to wait it out. He's going to wait for these buffalo to do their thing. Whereas if an elephant bull had to come here, these buffaloes would more than likely make, make way for the elephant bull. Monkey Boo Boo, thanks for the question. Oh, it's a small little youngster here. Let me just pan to the right quickly. Monkey Boo Boo, in terms of uh, buffaloes getting tick bite fever, there obviously is a chance that they could. Um, I'm actually not quite sure to be truthful. I'll give that a little read up. But, um, you know, something that buffalo are quite prone to would be sort of bovine tuberculosis. Remember, like we said, a lot of these animals out here are quite hardy. I'm not too sure how we'd even know if, if a buffalo did have tick bite fever. 
We've got one photo bombing us in the front. And that little calf is hiding there. But thanks, Monkey Boo Boo. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, it's actually a, that's a top notch question, that one. Out there we've got one lying down and a second one lying down. Let's have a look and see if there's any sort of rolling around in any type of mud wallowing here. These buffaloes, I'm sure, will take their time here by the mud wallow. Let's take you across to a very sleepy leopard. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I enjoy that buffalo sighting. We haven't had any rolling from Marips yet. With the amount of exercise he gave us all and got gave himself this morning, I think he's. Uh, Quite happy to just snooze a couple of uh, minutes away here. I love the way he's got his cheek rested on his there. Very, very sweet. Uh, but yes, uh, it's been a cracking morning. As I said uh, before, I'm not sure what, what point we you lost us there, but um, we, we've been trying to leave Marips for a while. And we finally did decide to leave him because he crossed through the drainage line where we couldn't get. So we thought, well, we'll just check the other road anyway just and he was on the road across the road in front of us and has now just taken up residence on this little termite mound uh, just to the east of Batalia. so very much i think the star of this morning's safari he was determined to get as much airtime as possible i think now, craig and i were just having a debate and i've even called in some um assistance from outside and obviously with you guys watching as well please do give me your two cents worth we know that um Marips's mother is tundi and i think it is assumed that tingana was the father but he's been sitting here the whole time now he's popped his head down but he's had his head up and he's had his tongue hanging out um, and i know yesterday with cedric that we were also looking at him sitting there with his tongue hanging out and i know old uh, hukamuri the hook always used to wander around with his tongue hanging out so we were just debating whether or not perhaps could the could the hook be the father? I don't know. I don't think we've got definitive evidence as to who the father is. Obviously, leopardesses are known to mate with um, multiple males, and I got that very interesting question about um, feline STDs, which I'm going to have to go and look into. Uh, there is some suggestion that some may be um, afflicted by herpes, um, but as of yet, I'm trying to look for something substantial. So could this be the hook's offspring? I'm really not sure. If anybody knows for sure, by all means let me know, but I just thought that tongue hanging out was quite characteristic. Uh, other thing, of course, to remind you is please don't forget that uh, this coming Sunday, so that's the 6th of November, um, available for all explorers, it's your chance to give any feedback, suggestions, and anything else you think could... Uh, uh, anything else that for you could help with Wild Earth moving forward? Graham's going to be around to answer any of your questions and give you some extra information about what lies ahead. So that will be at 7.30 Central African time this Sunday. I hope that you will be able to join him for that. It should be very, very interesting. Um, I believe we've just heard from Shreyas who thinks Mawati could possibly also be the father and um, possibly not actually Tingana, so we don't know. But thank you, Shreyas, for your uh, info there. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one how I just wonder with that strange habit I've never seen a leopard sort of just sit there with his tongue hanging out as much as Marips does and I, I'd never, I think I only got to see Hukumuri once but I know that was one of his defining features I've seen photos of him walking down the road with his tongue lolling out in front of him there as well so interesting but 
So that uh, whole point of, of leopards mating with multiple males is rather interesting. And we think that the whole point behind that um, is the, to just dupe the males into thinking that they're all the father so that there won't be any, won't be any infanticide. Uh, but for one sleepy predator, let's send you over to a predator who sounds like he might be on the move in Amakala. Okay, nice little surprise today. We've managed to locate this male lion, not too far from the area that we saw him yesterday afternoon with that warthog kill and the two lionesses. And he is highly mobile right now. So he is uh, probably heading towards where the females are, I'm guessing. He is sniffing around for them, trying to locate them, slash marking territory in between as well. Got some beautiful backlighting on him at the moment, giving him that halo effect on his mane. Magnificent animal, look at him, beautiful. Okay, so we do have a pole in the vehicle and he's heading straight behind the pole there. But he is mobile, he'll get into the gap shortly. Just stopping to listen around and look around. And he was roaring this morning. We could hear him all the way from the secretary bird's nest when we went and followed up there. Uh, Trish, no, they don't shed their manes uh, unless, you know, if they're in very weak condition. I have seen lions lose the, the portion of their manes before when they're very thin and emaciated. Okay. Okay, so he is uh, just moving over there. All right, should we try re-angle, Morgan? Yeah, okay. We're just going to try and just turn the vehicle over here. Okay, so this should do the trick over here. There we go, he's just heading uh, straight towards that small little thicket, localized thicket there. And pretty much v-lining towards where the den site is said to, to be. You might even mark that bush over there. Nah, just walking past it. You'll notice how um, he's using the road right now. It's a lot easier for him to walk on the road than through the bush. I know it's short grass over here, but when the bush does get thick, they'll often just stick to roads and paths just to save a little bit of energy. It's all about saving energy. He's just weaving his way through there. I would probably guess he's about 200 kilograms just over that. So yeah, for a cat, he's a big, big cat. Imagine how much they need to eat in a week or two weeks. 
but it is said that they can eat up to one fifth of their own body weight which is yeah roughly about 40 kilograms that is a lot Just going over that small peak. Okay, just disappearing down that slope. Oh, Ribs has got his tongue stuck out again. He's just popped his head up. Something attracted his attention from behind us, but we've just had a bit of a gust of wind. You can see the foliage in the background uh, moving around, so maybe carried an interesting scent. Uh, but I'm becoming more and more convinced that Hukumuri had something to do with this. The tongue hanging out, and there's something in his face as well. I'm, I'm seeing certain angles, and I see Hukumuri in there as well. So that's just my two cents worth. I obviously stand to be corrected, and without doing genetic testing, we'll probably never know. <laughs> that tongue's coming further and further out. Oh, no. Oh, well, far too much effort. Look at those beautiful paws. You ever want to know what a leopard's paw looks like? There you go, when we get very excited about leopard tracks and show you those uh, pug marks in the sand. That is what lays those tracks. You can clearly see those three defined lobes at the back there. You see those beautiful toes as well. There's something, again, whether it's just because of the stigma attached to the leopard, but I think the leopard track is such a beautiful track to look at. Although it is second behind one other one, and that, strangely enough, is the genet, the little genet track. Um, a genet track that almost looks like a baby leopard track. It's just, it's the most perfect symmetrical little track you'll ever see a genet track. It's my favourite one out here in the bush. But yeah, very strange about his tongue. Uh, Rebecca, I don't know if it's too, maybe it is too big to fit in his mouth. I don't know. I think, well, maybe he's got a muscular problem there. Or maybe he just drools a lot. I mean, who knows? But I've never seen a leopard sit here with his tongue hanging out like that before. I've uh, been very fortunate over... Yeah, a decade and a half to view many, many, many leopards uh, in the Savi Sands and other areas. Um, but yeah, I've never seen one other than Hukumuri who just sits there with his tongue lolling out like that. It's the sort of thing you sort of find in a cuddly toy, a little teddy. It's very strange. It must dry out a little bit. I wonder if it helps him cool down to some extent, a little bit of evaporative cooling without actually having to pant. Who knows? You can see he is breathing quite quickly there. He's certainly not sound asleep. You can see that chest rising and falling quite quickly. Normally if a cat, a bit like uh, us, when we're properly in deep sleep, our breathing will slow down and the whole uh, body system will, well not stall hopefully, but it, it will, everything will, will slow. So you can see he's still very much awake. All right, we're going to sit here probably for the rest of the drive with Mrips and see what he does. And speaking of tracks there, let's send you over to Chris. It sounds like he might be doing some tracks as well. I have tracks indeed. And not only tracks, remember just now, earlier, we mentioned we have reports of the wild dogs exactly what we have here right these are not that fresh but i thought it would be a good opportunity just to show you a little bit about a dog track right got a pad very symmetrical triangular pad flat in the back keyword don't have the three lobes as opposed to cats you got the toes how do we distinguish a dog track from that of a cat especially wild dogs which could have a similar size track as opposed to a hino or leopard right dogs first thing the tracks you can divide them in thirds two forward toes two side toes and then the pad chip 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 you can see there second tracks are spaced like that i'll show a diagram now in my book as well you can 
draw a perfect X between those two outer toes. Right, so let's just take a look here. This is not to scale. So again, look at the thirds. You can see there, one, two, three. There is no overlap there. You do not get that with hyenas or cats. And then obviously the claw marks, which is there. You can see some claw marks there as well. And then the X that I've drawn, you can see there, if you take from that claw, you can, there's no pad that interrupts. You can draw almost a perfect sort of cross or X through the track. But more importantly, flat in the back. Symmetrical triangular back pad, two side toes, two front toes, and as you can see, almost perfect thirds. You can divide the track in perfect thirds, and this will be relevant to all dog tracks. So that is a quick cheat sheet in order to distinguish dog tracks from that of cats. How would cats differ? Most often much more like round as track, not as oval shaped. And then the key there with cats is you'll have the very distinct three lobes in the back and the absence of claws. Well, talking about catch, maybe. We should go over to Kelly, who might have a little surprise in a tree. It's definitely not a leopard, this surprise in a tree, and it's not a massive surprise in a tree because this is where they live. But this is a beautiful leopard orchid that's flowering. Unfortunately, the light isn't giving this stunning orchid the credit it deserves. But these flowers are a very delicate yellow. And they've actually got a lovely scent. And tiny little spots on these beautiful yellow petals. But it's tricky to catch them in this light. There's over 18,000 species of orchid um, and I know I struggle to keep them alive, although I did recently um, manage to get a little one flowering, but we will see how long that lasts at home. So these, lots of people think these are parasitic um, plants, but they're not, they're epiphytes. So all this orchid is doing is just sitting here quietly on this dead tree, um, and it's getting all its nutrients from bits of stuff and things that are falling into the into the crown um, that are getting caught on the wind. It's not doing any damage to its host. We do see them in dead trees and uh, living trees as well, but they're beautiful orchids and they don't flower for too long. So I'm actually glad I spotted this one while it was still flowering. Sometimes they look like it's just sort of a pile of stuff in a tree, but it's always lovely to see these beautiful leopard orchids. Some people think it's birds or monkeys that will deposit these um, seeds of this plant high up in a tree here. Explorers, we want to hear from you. Your feedback is invaluable in shaping Wild Earth. Join Graham Wellington, our CEO and founder, on the 6th of November at 7.30pm for another town hall. Send in your questions, feedback, criticisms and suggestions. And as always, Graham will be answering and updating you live. See you there.
Well, welcome back to Maripsa's twitchy tail. He's fast asleep now, although his breathing's still quite rapid, so I don't think he's in a deep sleep, but his tail is now sort of twitch. Oop, there we go, a little twitchy twitch. Hopefully thinking about all the things he might catch later this afternoon or tonight. <laughs> we were looking, I think when we were watching um, Talumba the other day, we were just sort of, you see, when they see something and they go completely static and they go into that alert posture and just the tip of that tail twitches, it's like all of the energy that they've got they're, they're trying so hard to remain motionless and they're funneling all of that excitement right through the body and it ends up in the tail and it's almost like that excitement sort of leaching out into the ether uh, but they just can't quite control it. it's the one thing that gives them away but we know that tails are used in cats as a form of communication so it is unsurprising really but very interesting to watch and of course he's got that thick tail full belt oh. <laughs> oh, there's something irritating in there, maybe a little biting fly or something. That thick tail will help him with balance. Those huge, strong shoulders, razor sharp claws, and of course that special wrist. Oh, oh, we're off. Or are we just going to relocate? It is warming up a little bit. It's still overcast, but he is kind of lying in the open. I'm wondering if he's just going to go for a bit of shade. Yeah, I think it's just getting. Just in the last five minutes, the, the temperature has risen, even though the sun isn't coming out. There's been a noticeable increase in temperature, and he was lying out in the open, so a little bit of extra shade. So we're going to see if we get any extra activity from Marips, but I think he's probably going to plonk down now he's got a more of a shady spot. But let's send you quickly back over to Amakala and that beautiful male lion. Okay, we've managed to sort of relocate this male. He's been highly, highly mobile and uh, heading towards a drainage line at the moment. Very nice view, isn't it, eh? And just to let you know, we're gonna continue trying to follow them and see what's what's gonna gonna happen uh, during the escape to nature experience as well. So something definitely to look forward to. Hopefully they are still out and about during that time. So he's hot on the, the scent of the females and pretty much following them straight into the drainage line where the suspected den site is hidden. Henry, what will a lion patrol for? So quite a few things to mark territory, to survey for any competition, and then also prey. If there's Just at the end of Rebecca's Road, I'm still quietly hoping to bump into Jadulu. I haven't seen any tracks, any signs of her, but we know that often doesn't make much difference. Ben's had a fabulous morning there with young Marips. So nice to spend time with these animals. I think Andrew has been chatting about lion patrols. I'm assuming um, that conversation was along the lines of male lions when they're patrolling their territory. It's hard. It's hard work being a, a male lion. Um, they have to make sure that they... Um, set clear boundaries for where the other males can and cannot be um, especially this time of year lions mark territories well lots of things mark territories with scent and of course when it rains all that scent washes away 
And they spend a lot of time, lots of people often think that, oh, you know, I'd love to be a big male lion, king of the jungle, etc. Um, but it's hard work. They're, they're busy. They have to patrol, they're roaring um, under threat of other males all the time. Um, so patrolling is, is a very important part of um, a male lion's um, job. Job's not the right word. Um, function. They have to keep their ladies safe, they have to keep their cubbies safe. Um, and everyone knows that if... Uh, <laughs> may, yeah, maybe it's a male lion's mission in life. I like that, mission, mission in life. That's probably better than job. Job, mission in life, two slightly different things. Um, but they have to keep their ladies safe, their cubbies safe. As you know, um, if a non fathering male does bump into cubs he will um, take those cubs out of um, the lineage in order to replace those genes with his own nature is brutal um, but the strongest genes it's the strongest genes that form the lineage so yes uh, lion patrols very very important and to a certain extent um, females will also have a territory territory area um, that they don't really want other other females in although it's much easier for females to swap um, sometimes females will come out of prides and join up with another pride I'm actually there's a um, I'm looking at doing a, another another study course on lion lion behavior um, the best way to understand lion behavior in my opinion is to is to just be with lions all the time these documentaries that film lions obviously we've got our very well-known characters here on Wild Earth, all our favourites, and the story, the history of the lovely Blondie. God rest his soul. Um, how important he was for everyone that's watching. Um, but the best way to understand lion behaviour, in my opinion, is just, just to spend the whole time with them. Um, and you see these documentaries where they will uh, follow um, either an individual male or a pride for five years, I think um, that, that Dynasties, our, our hero, Mr. Attenborough, if you're watching, hello, don't write the chances. Um, best way to follow lion behavior is to uh, just spend time with them. I'm going to send you across to Nick and see if his buffaloes are up to any patrolling this morning. Welcome back to Karika and uh, from lions roaring and things like that to our buffaloes who are also quite vocal animals especially in a bigger herd you know somebody gets a fright and one pokes his horn somewhere one will bellow you know if if lions did have to catch one of these buffaloes the one that's brought down that would bellow in in the sort of the hope of calling that herd back you know um, so often you know if lions did take one of them down the automatic reaction uh, of the herd is, is they get a big fright and, and they kind of run off. Then that, you know, that, that initial shock kind of starts to wear off and the bellowing of, of that buffalo almost corrals the, 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 the herd back. Um, and you'll sometimes see uh, the buffaloes forming almost like a bullhorn shape in the attempt to, to try and surround the lions, kind of wedge them in from... from to different corners and try and drive them off that herd member that's been brought down um, obviously a buffalo is a big animal you know a big bulls gonna be seven eight hundred kilos or so and to try and and, and kill that it's not gonna take 30 seconds you know and when there's adrenaline fueling the system a buffalo is a formidable target to be taking down probably I would say for lions probably the toughest target that they could take um, so it's not going to be a short amount of time to bring one down. That is something that, that I'm still waiting to see. You know, I've been very lucky to, to have seen a number of kills out in the bush. But a full sort of buffalo takedown and, you know, something like we've just talked about, that's something I'm still waiting to witness. I've seen lions try to hunt buffalo. Um, 
quite unsuccessfully. I've seen a male, a male lion jump on the top of a, of a buffalo bull. There was a bachelor group of, of five bulls and uh, this male lion had, had kind of staked his place around this water hole and he gave the buffalo a crack. Megan, thanks for the question. Definitely, buffalo do have a very good sense of smell. All three of their senses, sight, hearing and smell, are, are all very, very well developed. Um, yeah, we touched on it the other day, you know, not, not too many species have, have all three senses that are razor sharp, really well developed. Um, you know, that's one of the things that makes buffalo such a hard target for lions to hunt, is that all three senses are well developed. Um, in terms of being very alert and, and spotting potential threat and then you times that by you know 30 or 40 different individuals in the herd and it's not it's not that easy for lions you know obviously females also having horns that's a, a, a big threat you know and you look at these buffaloes now and and you can kind of see they're quite relaxed they're taking it easy ears are switching around chasing little flies and mickeys around off at least but they're still very, very alert. If one had to get a, a fright and stand up or, um, you know, become quite alert, you'd see that would ripple through the whole herd. And they'd be looking at, at whatever's caught the attention of that one. So buffaloes do have a very, very good sense of smell. You know, particularly around this little mud wallow and things that we've just seen them come down to. They know that those are those are vulnerable positions for them because things like lions do like to use it as sort of an ambush position. Remember, buffaloes will have their heads down, so looking down towards the water when they're drinking. But even while they're doing that, or even more, they will be listening carefully and smelling very carefully. But stick around with us as we head into Escape to Nature and see what this uh, herd of buffaloes do get up to and maybe if anybody else comes down to the mud wallow that they've been to. Maybe some warthogs or maybe rhino if we're lucky. And you can see here why people say when predators try and take a zebra, it's these stripes to make it difficult this <laughs> when they pass each other that just looked like one long zebra there all these stripes blending them into each other now just as we get there they're going to wander off behind the tree this is a fairly standard size group of zebra for juma Obviously, some areas, zebra herds can get much bigger. It looks like there's one stallion in here and then two, two fem females with two youngsters. Nice to see these zebra on Juma. See, look, 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 look. He's just... I think that's the stallion there. He's just turned those females and said, no, no, we're not going that way. Look, look, look. Just going to reposition them, Paul. Just going to roll back a little bit. It's actually a lovely view of these zebra in this and there's quite nice light as well. I think let's try to stay with them. That constant tail swishing. It's quite uniform, this beautiful tail swish. It's 
it's almost mesmerizing this tail swish here like like the ripples on that millipede this morning very relaxing I'm actually trying to recognize the stallion in this herd and see if we can't pick him up next time so don't forget if you haven't had chance to watch the whole show today you can download our app you can watch best bits highlights from morning and afternoon drive along with escape to nature but they're all best bits though all the bits are the best bits i just memorized this which where's he gone now the stallion of this group has actually got quite a lot of marks around his chest so i'm gonna keep an eye on these zebra and see if we can't recognize him again I'm going to send you across to the lovely Ben and see if we can find one last view of your boy, Maribs. Thank you very much, Kelly. Well, what an incredible morning it has been. Prince Maribs has given us quite the show this morning. Uh, we found him lounging on a log at Gary Dam, then he's walked halfway across Juma. Um, and now lying here just east of Battle Lane, looks like he's settled in for the day. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It has been an absolutely wonderful drive and a pleasure to share it with you. And we will hope to see you in Escape to Nature straight after this show. Have a wonderful rest of the day.